Time for the final build video. We have our new wheel mounted up. Everything's on bearings. We've really cut as much of the play as possible out of this system and we're ready to get it going here. So we need some teeth or wedges for the inside of that. This wheel here will nest inside that drive wheel. It's the same size. And what we need is for the length of the wedge plus the space after it to divide evenly into this distance. And it looks like eight divisions is gonna work based on our test piece. So we need to figure out a way to do that. Dividing a circle into six is pretty easy. You can take the compass that made it and work your way around for eight. We could take a piece of paper that was like this and fold it in half three times. You get a little bit of issue with the creases, but after thinking about this, I remembered that it's 2015. So I just printed off some circles on Corel Draw that are in 8, 10, and 12 divisions, and we're gonna use that. It'll be right on, no creases, and if we need to do it again, we can, we can do it again. Jig time. We've mounted this here on a pretty simple setup, and I'm indexing off of uh, marks which are on the side of the wheel. And I did that by putting that over top of my paper printout and just marking where the divisions were. Cutting the wedges free requires you to put the blade at a 45 degree angle and then shift that axle assembly over a little bit. But it's basically the same operation. Everything looks good with the wedge. All the lines are straight. And it's worth noting that the reason we're doing this with that radius is so that it nests better into the drive wheel. We cut seven more of those wedges with the same strategy and are ultimately left with a nice pinwheel pattern, which also shows off my little indexing strategy there. We have our drive wheel here with our wedges and their matching radius, but what I really need is some way to divide these out evenly into their eight slots around the perimeter. If I only had some sort of physical thing they could do that. This is why it pays to hold on to scrap pieces sometimes, especially when they're cool looking like that. And with each wedge fitting so well, it only takes a dab of glue and one nail to secure it in place. Then I put a wedge in the curve so each one registers in the same spot. Before we mount the drive wheel and obscure this, I thought I'd show the inside view. That top bearing, which is going back and forth, is what actually gets driven by those wedges, and the drive wheel itself pivots on the bearing to the right of that. You'll notice that this is a new wheel, and that's because we goofed up the spacing originally. I had marked it on the outside of that drive wheel that's 10 inches in diameter, then applied that distance to the wheel which became the pinwheel that's 8 inches in diameter, which put them too far apart. So we made an adjustment to split it into 10, and now the spacing is ready to go. We'll jump ahead a little bit to show what that ideal spacing gives us. You can see the, when the bearing or the pendulum goes into the screen, it's going to meet that wedge, then be driven, and when it's done driving, it just barely clears it on the return. The energy for this motion is provided by a counterweight, which wraps around the axis of that drive wheel and hangs down on the other side. It's hard to figure out exactly how much weight you need right off the bat, so we just start off with an iron thing and add clamps as necessary. The diameter of that center bolt obviously affects how much leverage the counterweight has, so ideally you want to go to a very small axle and a very heavy weight. We tried doing this by drilling down the center of the bolt and tapping for an 832 screw, but even if you use thin twine, it just doesn't have enough leverage and there's too much flex. When you're dealing with a shaft that small, it any small flexing really screws up the leverage and makes it, you know, not being in the center and it just won't rotate. We switched that axle back to 5 sixteenths for the time being and decided to focus on this stop, which works pretty well, but it's a bit loud and does bounce when it first hits. A shoulder bolt and a few different spring weights allowed us to experiment. This first one did a good job damping that initial impact, but you can see it doesn't, it doesn't return, so it snaps back into place when it's knocked out and kind of negates the whole quietness aspect. A homemade rubber grommet helped with the return snap factor, but it didn't help with the fact that all that energy in the spring is completely wasted. Using a heavier spring helped with that waste factor, but it introduced a bounce. And we realized that part of the reason why it's bouncing is not just the spring, 
it's that the shaft that bolt is sitting in is quite a bit longer than it. We have grease, so it's a relatively close fit. I think the air is also helping it bounce. You can't see it later, but we ended up packing that almost entirely full of grease, and it really helped with this bounce. Using a screw on the end was also convenient because it's so easy to adjust. The screw which triggers the top of the lock is there for the same reason. It really cuts down on the drudgery factor of a project when you can experiment with settings in just a few seconds. The drive wheel and timing are looking fairly good, so we want to increase its run time. Right now it gets about four and a half minutes, which is pretty good, but we're aiming for 10. We tried to gear it up by decreasing the size of that shaft and increasing the weight. That didn't work, so we're going to use actual plywood gears. The gears were designed on the Wood Gears downloadable gear template, and it works great, so I'll definitely give a thumbs up to that tool. With all the weight and forces that were going on that drive wheel, we're having trouble getting it to run true. There's a couple of reasons for that, but mainly it's a compression fit with a relatively small shaft on a large wheel, so that's something to keep in mind in the future. I was actually a little concerned that we may have bent the bolt, or maybe it was bent to begin with, so we ran it down the table saw just to check its straightness. With the gear set up, most of the weight is going to be borne on the large gear, so I tried to get ahead of the cantilever issue by using a, a larger bolt and larger bearings, but the bearings were a bit too large, so we built it up with duct foil tape. This worked fairly well, although there was quite a bit of adjustment, which is not going to make it into this video. We did have to play again, though, with our ratio of that drive shaft size to the amount of weight that's on there. The first one we tried, which you just saw with the blue parachute cord, was much too large. So we needed to go down to something a lot smaller, and we ended up using the bolt itself, but that was still too large. So we set it up in this kind of strange contraption here and used a grinder to turn it down to a much smaller size. The gears were working fairly well, but there were still a few tight spots. Some of that is going to be due to the fact that we used a jigsaw and I was kind of in a hurry. But really the main problem is that it wasn't running true, as you can see here. We eventually brought this issue down to the fact that it, it's compressing on that wheel, and it's only over a small area which had some areas ripped out when we took off another version. So we changed it to a larger circle. An old diamond angle grinder blade, in fact. We did have to bump the counterweight up a bit, to account for the size of that shaft because I didn't feel like making it larger after I put all that effort into making it smaller, but it works great. It's about 40 pounds. That's a 35 pound kettlebell and about five pounds worth of clamps. The kettlebell was a little bit slippery though, so we did lose a clamp on occasion. I'm a pretty organized guy, so it's easy to tell how engrossed I've been in a project by the amount of disorder that manages to creep in around me while I'm distracted. At the end though, it's always satisfying to go through and put everything back where it belongs. Now that it's running fairly smoothly and we've made our adjustments, it's time to do a duration test and see if we can hit our 10 minute mark. It takes a bit of time to show the whole thing because it did work. It made it for 10 minutes and 20 seconds. So even with a 10x speed up, it takes over a minute. I'm gonna skip a lot of it. But it worked great, and we just started it up with the weight at the top and let it go down. No problem. We get about 30 seconds an inch, so this will be worth another minute when I trim this one to the flat dimension. Rewinding is a little cumbersome right now, but I have a few ideas on that that could be fixed in a future version. You could have a crank on that small gear that you crank around, and you could also just put a one-way bearing on the other thing and that would allow it to, uh, you could lift it up and it would rewind. Well, there you have it, the basic escapement cradle mechanism. I kind of ran out of time as far as calculating any energy efficiencies on this version, but suffice to say it's not too pretty. We're losing energy in a lot of different areas. More than a few of these things you see as you're building it, but you just don't have time to go back and change it and rebuild from scratch every time because the project would never get done. But I would like to come back at some point and revisit this, support the axles on both sides, and change the way that the wedge works because I think we could get a lot more time out of this. When I say the wedge shape, it's a combination of the wedge and the roller 
when it rolls up to that, the angle of that wedge relative to the motion of that wheel changes as it's pushing on it. And that pendulum is going very slow when it first starts pushing. So later, that wedge is just kind of catching up with it. That's wasting energy. And the last 15%-ish of its stroke, it kind of skips out of the way. And using a smaller bearing on the top of that pendulum would help that. So there's a few areas like that that are no-brainers. Change of diameter, boom, instant efficiency gain. The stop and the screw that releases it is one of my favorite parts to watch on this because everything's adjusted correctly and there's very little wasted energy. A purpose-built counterweight would also gain us some time because it could be more compact vertically. But this one was sitting right there on the floor and it did the trick. That's it for now. Thank you for watching.